The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily radio show. We're already at the last show of the week, Friday morning here in our Edmond uh, studio, our headquarters studio in uh, North Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you along with us on today's show. Last night we had the uh, graduation ball um, and uh, also quite a few of our uh, alumni students from over the years that were uh, there attending with us, enjoying the dance, enjoying the, uh, the fine meal that was prepared for us as well. We have a graduation brunch coming up on uh, Sunday and, uh, and then, of course, the graduation ceremony in the afternoon. For those of you who are members of the, the PCG, um, the graduation ceremony will actually be available on the PCGO or PCOG uh, website if you have credentials for that. You can, uh, you can join us and uh, yeah, I believe, I believe it's, it's at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Is that right? Does anyone know in there? <laughs> 3 p.m. All right. 3 p.m. this Sunday few emails coming in in response to yesterday's show it says look for look for this ev- I look for this every day it's like my number one addiction especially since COVID began what a ride this is turning into I can't stand the thought of missing one TDRS that's trumpet daily radio show another one here says thank you for this program Mr. Flurry I love the positivity it brings fact over emotion the truth over lies, light over darkness, and hope over discouragement. Keep up the good work. Another one here coming in from uh, England. It says, lovely to hear your voice. Wish I was there to celebrate with you. And then this one says, I wish Stephen Flurry would look into Justin Trudeau. So uh, we better turn the, uh, the news gatherers loose on Mr. Trudeau. One last one here says, just read, the, uh, uh, just read the article, sorry, about Donald uh, Trump uh, being the greatest leader since Churchill. It made my day. So interesting. That's, uh, of course, in response to the trumpet brief that went out last night from uh, Brad McDonald over in the UK. That'll be posted at the, the website today as well if you haven't yet uh, read that. Well, through so much of uh, the news that we've been discussing in recent weeks, we've often talked, and we've done it even this week, we've talked about the, the spiritual dimension behind the, the lies and the deception. And, of course, you're all very familiar with Revelation 12 and verse 9, uh, where it says, the, dr- the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. <clears throat> so this devil, Satan the devil, he's, uh, he's, he's left on the throne of this earth for uh, the 6,000 years of human civilization. Six days, as far as God looks at it. And then the seventh day, that's coming soon. The kingdom of God established on this earth. The wonderful world of tomorrow. A Sabbath rest from sin finally a utopia we're not quite there yet though and uh so many prophecies talk about the evil and the deception and the lies worsening as we draw closer to the return of christ i'll refer you to second timothy three again but as far as other prophecies, Matthew 24, you put that together with, uh, with Revelation 6, the four horsemen of the, the apocalypse. If you keep in mind, as our four horsemen booklet brings out, that uh, first horseman of the apocalypse, it conquers by deception. Religious deception. Religion doesn't have the answers. Religion doesn't have the solution to the many problems of this world. In our booklet, it says the first and most deadly horseman is religious deception. Deception. That's the most deadly of all the horsemen, of all these seals of revelation. The most deadly is deception. Deception. Lies. Lies spread by the God of this world. 
very, as we'll see a little bit later on from the Telegraph, uh, very compelling lies, lies that people are convinced it's the truth. It has to be the truth. It must be the truth. And even when facts are presented to the contrary, still, still, so many will continue right on believing lies. And it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan, it, see, it says here, has blinded the minds of men. He has blinded the minds of men to the truth. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, this is where it talks about the great uh, false religious system. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. False apostles pretending to be Jesus Christ's apostles. They transform themselves, and Paul goes on to say, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's the way Satan presents himself. He's just an innocent angel. He's just an innocent angel that's concerned only with just really establishing truth. And yet, the Bible says he is the father of lies, and there's no truth in him. That's why we have to look at the fruits. You look around the world today, and you see the evidence. You see the fruits of Satan's work, his works of destruction, his works of evil, his works of division and strife. So much suffering, so much evil. But... You read here in 2 Corinthians 11, and most of the time Satan's not going to come after us with, with really warlike rhetoric. He's going to come after us as an angel of light to try to, convince, to try to convince us that he's just telling us the truth. Verse 14, it says, and no marvel, here again, I'll read it uh, one more time, more, uh, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And then Paul continues saying, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be a according to their works. I just want to focus your attention there on it is no great thing. This is not that difficult for Satan to pull off. To deceive human beings. To deceive even experts. Even the highly educated. Well, Mr. Armstrong used to talk about how the, <laughs> these people are often the most deceived. Because they're just filled with vanity. Full of pride. It's no great thing for Satan to be able to deceive ministers even. We look around this world today and it is deceived through and through. False religion. And then look at all the problems government is causing at the moment. This is why it's essential for us as God's family to... Judge by fruits. That's what Jesus said we have to look to in Matthew 7. We have to examine the fruits. And so, to just take an example we've been talking about the last few days, if uh, Mr. and Mrs. Obama come forward with a video to promote children's books, it looks nice, it sounds great. I don't know anything about the book they were promoting, but... They've got a little five-minute video and the two of them together holding up a, a book for little children and promoting libraries and telling families, encouraging families to get into the library and to read. We can't disagree with that as long as you're reading the right things. But here comes this, this angel. That's what it looks like. 
It's, it's perfect. It, given all that's happening, given all that's being exposed, what a perfect response from the devil. Look, we're just here to, <clears throat> to build up the family and to promote reading and, and education for young people. And then, though, you look at the, the trail of destruction, as we talked about on yesterday's program, and Satan has been working and working at it. He has been working at this for generations now. Back at the start of this month, May the 1st, I referred you to my father's article from 2016, The Roots of America's Dangerous Turn Left. Where did it start? How did we get to where we are today? A a government in the United States using police state tactics, spying on political opponents, persecuting them, sending them to jail, targeting conservative groups. Well, this is from my father's article from 2016. He said, During the Cold War, there was a lot of fear within America about the spread of communism. Today, most Americans no longer consider it a threat of any concern. And that's what I talked about on that program from May 1st, why why most Americans no longer feel threatened by communism. We used to be quite concerned about that, going back to the 1940s, the 1950s. Well, really, all through the Cold War, like my father brings out. But he says in this 2016 piece, it is of grave concern. Few people realize it, but many mainstream political views in America are identical to and trace directly back to the ideals and beliefs of communism. They sure do. They trace right back to the ideals and beliefs of communism. And we write about this in Great Again. There's a little bit in America Under Attack as well. And then, of course, a whole chapter in He Was Right that that goes back to what Herbert Armstrong was saying in the 1940s and 50s. The ultimate goal or objective of this communist movement, the communist infiltration, Real Clear uh, History had an article today on the return of American anti-communism. It says here, as Americans continue to suffer deaths and economic carnage as a result of a virus unleashed on the world by uh, the Chinese Communist Party, a growing anti-communism is resurfacing in the United States and the West. It has a rich and most laudable history. I think he's a little more optimistic about this anti-communism movement than we would be. But he does bring up some important history. It says, at the end of the 20th century, six European authors contributed to a book titled The Black Book of Communism. We've got copies of this uh, at Edstone. Thoroughly researched. And this just basically looks at communism in the 20th century. And the, just the tidal wave of destruction everywhere that it went. Millions and millions of lives just snuffed out. It says the Black Book of Communism, which detailed the terror, crimes, and repression of communist regimes since 1917, the year that Lenin's Bolsheviks established the first communist state in Russia. It says the book is a historical catalog of horrors perpetrated by all communist regimes. It's happened in all of them, every single one. It says there was no exception. Every communist government has ruled by coercion and terror. And we've gotten a little glimpse of that in these revelations over the last few years. Coercion and terror. It says in the book's forward, Martin Malia noted that the communist record offers the most colossal case of political carnage in history, yet communism has never suffered from the stigma associated with Nazism. 
Malia believes the, that one reason why this is so is that Nazis never pretended to be virtuous. The communists, by contrast, trumpeting their humanism, hoodwinked millions around the globe for decades and got away with murder on the ultimate scale. And yet you look at it today, and it, as we've discussed so much before and, and written about at thetrumpet.com, there's quite a number of people in the United States and in Great Britain that find this ideology, uh, they, find it, they find it to be something that we should have or, or at least have more of. You think of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn and the millions and millions of followers. It says communism appealed, and in some cases still appeals, primarily to intellectuals who think themselves too smart to believe in God. It says for them to admit the failure of communism, the evil of communism, would, Malia writes, effectively shut the door on an earthly utopia, which is the abstract dream of Marxists, of all stripes, and a good many socialists as well. They think they're working toward a utopian dreamland, a dream world. And yet that book that it refers to, the Black Book of Communism, that exposes what they've done. That book tells you about the fruits of the communist movement. Everywhere it goes, every nation it, enter, it enters into. It says here, for uh, four years before the Black Book of Communism appeared, Richard Gidd Powers wrote, uh, Not Without Honor, the History of American Anti-Communism. It says Powers, Powers' book mostly lauded the efforts of anti-communism uh, during the 20th century. But he makes the point here, I'll just paraphrase it, that uh, when Senator McCarthy came out and wanted to blow the whistle on these communists that had infiltrated the, uh, the administrations of FDR and then Harry Truman after him, that what happened is basically the tables were turned on McCarthy he was made out to be this, you know, this extreme radical that was just going around on a witch hunt, trying to and trying to say there's a communist in every corner. It says here uh, James uh, Burnham was closer to the truth when he explained that McCarthyism was primarily a weapon used by communists and liberals to discredit conservative anti-communists. McCarthy, to be sure, was at, at times erratic, but McCarthy, if anything, underestimated the communist infiltration of the Roosevelt and Truman administration. And we now know this because there's been a lot more facts made known since McCarthy was made out to be this, you know, this ghoulish, <laughs> this ghoulish uh, hunter of, of communists. They're in Hollywood. They're in Washington, D.C., they're everywhere. They're in big media. And of course, like I said in that program a few weeks ago, if you look at the fruits now, if you look at political movements in the U.S. and Britain today, if you look at just the ideology, if you look at what's happened to universities, and yes, if you look at what happened in the Antiochus administration for eight years and even carrying into the Jeroboam uh, end, I think McCarthy and others, Nixon and <laughs> those on the, uh, the committees back then, they were on to something. They may have been a little misguided here and there. It says, writing in the Washington Post in 1996, Van Hoffman concluded that enough new information has come to light about the communists and the U.S. government that we may now say that point by point, Joe McCarthy got it all wrong, and yet was still closer to the truth than those who ridiculed him. You look at the works or the fruits, you judge by fruits like Jesus said, and well, what do you see today? Today, you, if you get any of this history in high schools and in colleges, well, McCarthyism, people hear some about that and think, well, that's just you know, this unjustified witch hunt. But they hear little or nothing about the actual problem 
of communist infiltration. It, it was a problem. It did exist. And it has spread since then. And that really should be an obvious truth. But like I said on that program May 1st, and my father brings this out in the 2016 article, people aren't even concerned about it today. Not like we were during the Cold War. Listen to what we covered on yesterday's program, all of this unmasking. I think something like 50 requests to unmask General Flynn on these transcripts made by more than 30 people, including six ambassadors, I think it was, or maybe four or five ambassadors, five or six individuals from the Treasury Department. Everybody was spying on General Flynn during that transition from Barack Obama's administration to Donald Trump. This was what Trey, Trey Gowdy said yesterday. He used to be a congressman. He's since uh, uh, moved on. Um, but he was part of those investigations and so many of those hearings that we talked about yesterday and the day before on the program. Uh, back in 2017 uh, and on up into, I think, whenever he stepped down, uh, in any event, he's now a commentator that uh, speaks on occasion uh, on Fox News. And this is what he said yesterday about the unmasking that the Obama administration was engaged in, clip seven. I mean, we have these surveillance programs that allow collection on American citizens. You're supposed to safeguard their identity. But Sandra, it's not just Michael Flynn. There was an unmasking request made the morning of the inauguration. The morning of the inauguration. President Trump's family members' names were unmasked. So that needs to be reformed. But you also have a really nice witness list to start investigating the leak of classified information. And I'd be curious how many people on this unmasking list have been interviewed by the FBI over the leak. The main part I wanted you to hear there is that he said there were others. Even President Trump's uh, family members, their names were unmasked. It was going on even up to Inauguration Day, <laughs> January 20th, 2017. And so what we heard or what we saw or what we discussed yesterday, that was just a tiny little window. That was focused just on General Flynn. Now you could say, well, how does Trey Gowdy know? Just like so many people were saying, how, how does Devin Nunes know? Well, we'll see. Going back to what my father said in 2016, few people realize it, but many mainstream political views in America today are identical to and trace directly back to the ideals and beliefs of communism. But look at the way these governors in these blue states, look at the way they're, they're imposing lockdowns and using technology to spy on Americans and encouraging neighbors to snitch. That's just with the COVID-19. And then you look at all of this nefarious activity going on in the shadows back in 2016 and, and 17 and continues even to this day. Senator Rand Paul, we've played a few clips from him this week. He's been busy, I guess, but he... He talked yesterday about the constitutional problems with uh, these FISA court applications. And we know about how dishonest that was and how that those applications to spy on Carter Page, to spy on an American. And Carter Page had no idea it was even going on. It was all it was all done behind closed doors and based on the Steele dossier. And one of the points that Rand Paul brings out here is that fundamentally the problem here is that you don't have any representation. If the FBI or whoever goes in there and says, hey, we need a warrant to spy on this guy, he's a, he's a bad guy. Well, the bad guy doesn't have his lawyer in there saying to the judge, no, he's not. He's not a spy. What is this based on? These charges, they're going to they're gonna spy on this individual based on what? We now know it was based on the Steele dossier, the dirty dossier. Here's Rand Paul from yesterday, clip four. The deficiency of the FISA court 
and why it's not constitutional is you don't get a lawyer. You actually don't even get told that you've been accused of a crime. The only reason we know that President Trump's campaign got caught up in this is he won. Because he won and now has the power to open and put sunlight on this, we are now able to see this. If this had been an ordinary American caught up in this, you would never be told. You would never get a lawyer, and you would have been brought before this investigative body and allowed to search vast amounts of your private information without probable cause. That is not constitutional, and I don't think we can make it constitutional. Not constitutional. It isn't. It isn't. And I like here again, another statement that you could have read at the trumpet two, three, two, three years ago. He says the only reason we even know this was going on is because Donald Trump won. The only reason we even know all of this was happening is because his administration has cast light upon it. He's exposed it. Bill Barr, he's exposed it, or is exposing it. Lee Smith at the New York Post, talking about all the unmasking that we uh, discussed yesterday. It says, interviews of former Obama officials released last week show that the previous White House promoted a culture of espionage. They promoted this. Here again, this is communist ideology, through and through. This is corruption right at the very top. And it was promoted. This spirit of espionage, says Republican Congressman Trey Gowdy, told uh, Samantha Power that she had that she is the largest unmasker of U.S. persons in our history. This is Samantha Power. Remember, the ambassador to the United Nations has nothing to do with the intelligence community. The largest unmasker of U.S. persons in our history. It says, pressed to explain why she unmasked more than 300 U.S. citizens in less than a year, she could not muster an answer. She just didn't have a a response. And, of course, with respect to General Flynn, she had no recollection of ever unmasking him. She did it seven times during that window, that transition period. But her testimony in 2017... Her testimony just, what, 10 10 months after she had unmasked him uh, seven times? She had no recollection. It says, nearly three years ago, this is Lee Smith, then chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, held a brief press conference to announce that he'd found evidence of wide-scale unmasking of Trump officials. See, plural, not just Flynn. Trey Gowdy says... Trump's family, anyone basically in Trump's orbit, you were, you were a suspect because of this sham investigation presented as a counterintelligence investigation, but carefully, carefully withheld from the incoming president of the United States. He was a target, that's why. It says Nunes explained that none of this surveillance was related to Russia or the intervention of Russian uh, or the investigation of Russian activities. It was just if you were associated with Donald Trump, even if it had nothing to do with Russia at all. Let the unmasking begin. Let's start snooping. Let's start. Let's see if we can get some dirt on him. This was the insurance policy as Peter struck said in his text message. Lee Smith writes, his statement now comes into clearer focus, the statement from Nunes. This was about Obama's massive surveillance of his political opponents. The list published Tuesday is evidence that the heir to that legacy is Joe Biden. He was in the administration. He was the number two man in the Obama administration. And now he's the, he's the one running against President Trump for this November's election. Listen to what he said yesterday when he, you've already heard, I can play the other one, I guess, again here in a second, too. 
you heard what Vice President Biden said to George Stephanopoulos, and Stephanopoulos pushed back a little bit and said, well, you were in that January 5th meeting. And then he said, well, I, I did know about the investigation. Uh, then yesterday, he's being questioned by, uh, I think it's Lawrence O'Donnell, about this investigation into Mike Flynn. And listen to what uh, Vice President Biden had to say. Clip one. Uh, Mr. Vice President, what was your involvement in the investigation uh, of Michael Flynn and the FBI investigation of Michael Flynn? I was never a part or had any knowledge of any criminal investigation into Flynn while I was in office, period. Not one single time. One single time, or I'm not quite sure how what that means there at the end, but he says he didn't have any knowledge of any criminal. This time he adds criminal investigation. So perhaps this is what his handlers are now saying. Look, this has got to be carefully worded. Uh, you knew there was some kind of an investigation, but you didn't know anything about it. You certainly didn't know it was uh, a criminal investigation. Technically, I don't even think it became that until later. In any event, he was there. He was in the meeting. He was unmasking or making requests for unmasking. And he, like Lee Smith says, he's the heir to that Obama legacy. It's the same spirit. And here they are trying to explain it all away this week, saying that, as John Brennan yesterday and James Clapper, they, will, they were all out there saying this is no big deal. Unmasking happens all the time. Don't you worry about it. And then the commentators chiming in, like Brian Williams, saying, can you, Mr. Brennan, can you explain to our viewers uh, why Fox News is obsessed with this? Why they're, they're, they're creating hours and hours of programming for this? And, of course, Brennan, just like the media, he says it's all meant to be a distraction. So they've got their talking points. Biden didn't know much. Uh, it's just President Trump trying to distract us away from the, the COVID crisis. And as far as unmasking, if you want to ask me about that, well, it's just uh, something that's pretty commonly done. This is what James Clapper said yesterday, clip five. It's a routine thing. It's appropriate and legitimate. Routine, appropriate, and uh, legitimate. And then the funny thing, I think this was probably in the same exchange, He's being interviewed by, uh, I believe, CNN, maybe MSNBC. In any event, the, the uh, reporter actually asked a pretty tough question a little ways into this. And then all of a sudden, the video feed for James Clapper just completely cuts out, which was quite humorous. Clip six. OK, so asking for names, nothing wrong with that. Unmasking in and of itself, nothing wrong with that. Leaking classified information. And by definition, these phone calls were classified. That's a problem, correct? Uh, absolutely, it is. Um, and if anyone did leak the contents of these conversations with or without the name, that would be a problem, yes? Uh, we've lost the shot. I wonder if we can at least get him on the phone. If he lost the audio first, perhaps he did. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Everybody's inter being interviewed from remote locations because of COVID-19, so I guess that works in your favor. If you don't like the way the interview is going, you can maybe kick at the cords under the desk. In any event, he probably lost his audio. The video cut out right after he was asked, okay, unmasking serious, but now if you unmask and then someone leaks, and the thing of it is someone did leak, and every single individual on that list that came out the other day they should be interviewed by the FBI, just like Trey Gowdy said. Perhaps they are being interviewed. Perhaps John Durham is, is uh, getting around to that. But one of them leaked it to the Washington Post. And that's a felony. As many as 10 years in prison, I've heard. A felony. This was just routine, the unmasking. Well, how about the, uh, the leaking? Because you go back and look at this strategy, as we've covered this week, the attempted coup, and it wouldn't have gone forward. It wouldn't have gone as far as it did without the strategic leaking 
that happened every step along the way. This was Rand Paul yesterday. I think this is from a Fox News interview where he says, you know, this goes all the way up to the top. That's what we're that's what we're learning here. Here's clip three. But this is a big thing. The entire inner circle was listening to this phone call, not for national security reasons. They were listening to it because they wanted to do anything they could do to damage the incoming administration. They were also doing it because they were desperate, because they did not have any evidence of Russian collusion. So they were trying so hard to find something because they'd gotten the ball rolling on this. And I think if we were to declassify any meetings about crossfire hurricane, you'd find that President Obama was in those and leading those. And I think if you were to ask any of these people under oath, was President Obama aware of the unmasking? Did he approve of the unmasking of General Flynn? I think you'll find this goes to the very top. All the way to the top. Of course it does. Of course it does. If you were to, while we're in the spirit of unmasking, if you uh, declassify some of those, uh, those meetings regarding Crossfire Hurricane, you know it goes all the way to Barack Obama's office. The Oval Office in the White House. You had people in the White House that were unmasking Flynn. And he's just one that we know of. Kim Strassel at the Wall Street Journal. She writes, William Barr versus the Beltway. It says, in the Bible, we are told that the truth will set us free. In the Beltway, that's uh, speaking of Washington, D.C., in the Beltway, we find that the truth tellers get hammered. This is the this is the most, I guess you would say the most powerful nation, the most influential city in the world. Washington, DC, America's capital city, home of the White House, Congress, the DOJ, the FBI. And on and on it goes, all of those government buildings. And someone comes in and starts telling the truth, well, you can't operate this way. We've got some bureaucrats that have been around for three, four decades in some cases. He says, or she does, sorry, take, take William Barr, the attorney general, in recent weeks has made good on his pledge to be transparent about the Justice Department's actions in the 2016 election and to right wrongs. So she goes through what they did to correct the egregious and un unwarranted attack on, on Mike Flynn and how that those charges were dropped. She mentions uh, the acting director of national intelligence, Richard Grinnell, who's, who's uh, released some of these documents or at least forced Adam Schiff uh, to do that a few days ago or last week. Kim Strassel says, the bright light in this morass of rough justice and partisan slander is Mr. Barr himself. He knew what he was, uh, he knew what was coming and appears unfazed and unwilling to be rolled into meekness. The country is lucky to have a top law enforcement officer who cares more about justice and his department's reputation than about the former officials who abused its power. It says, the more they howl, the more obvious their guilt. <laughs> she starts her column with, in the Bible, we're told that the truth will set you free. The truth, that's what sets us free from captivity, from deception. And as she says at the end of her piece, the more these dirty cops howl in protest, I think it was John Brennan yesterday who talked about he had just never seen this level of corruption in the Trump administration, not in his entire lifetime. The more they howl, the more obvious their guilt. When we come back, we'll, speaking of truth and being set free from deception, we'll look at the one-sided coverage that the coronavirus gets within the major media there's only one story that's allowed to be told. And we've seen examples, I've covered them on this program, of people that take a different view. Their videos are banned. They're removed. They're deleted. I think my father, this program he had 
going out this, I believe it's this weekend. There was a station that rejected it just because he he uh, attributed the Wuhan virus to, well, to Wuhan, to China. There's just certain things that you're not supposed to say, even if it's the truth. Even if it's the truth. Well, I'm already into it. I guess we can forget the promo. <laughs> this is from The Telegraph. The official COVID story is one-sided to the point of deceit. The, the Daily Telegraph. I think, uh, I think London, there's a, a story here later. London had 24 new cases of coronavirus yesterday. 24 in a city of millions and millions. And it's still locked down. People are saying, come on, how much longer? And there's no leadership. There's no courage. So it just continues because this is what we're supposed to do. But listen to this in the Telegraph. It says, the public is being so heavily bombarded with biased, selective information that it is almost impossible to make out the truth. This is the age we're living in. We're just being bombarded with it. Lies and deception. And there's a spirit behind it, as I said at the start. People can't, they can't make out the truth. This says, arguably, the COVID crisis is being presented in such a one-sided, misleading, and alarmist manner that the, the public is effectively being lied to. It says, but the lie is now so dramatically compelling, so morally powerful, that like the virus itself, it may be impossible to defeat and prove endemic. The lies are like the virus itself. It's impossible to stamp it out. Maybe, maybe you can flatten the curve a little bit. But it's impossible. This is the telegraph. This is one of the leading dailies in, in, in the UK. Talking about how completely one-sided this coverage is. How misleading the coverage is. How alarmist the coverage is. You can only say one thing. It has to fit within the one narrative. That this is spreading. That is danger that everyone's in, at danger or in danger young people there's a new strain now evidently that's what we hear the, a new strain that's particularly it's it's going after young people it says here the tragedy is well let me back up it says but the lie is now so dramatically compelling so morally powerful that like the virus itself it may be impossible to defeat says the best we can uh, now do is to manage it in a targeted fashion. <laughs> so all we can do, he's talking, he's using the analogy of the virus itself. All we can do is just kind of mitigate it a little bit. Try to prevent it from spreading too far. But what, a, what an acknowledgement here. This is just a simple column at the Daily Telegraph. Acknowledging the fact that the lies are so, they are so misleading and one-sided. They're so effective, though. They're so dramatically compelling. They're so morally powerful that, that we just can't stamp it out. It says, the tragedy is we have blown coronavirus out of proportion to such a degree that it is obscuring our view of another endemic. Uh, epidemic rather, surging non-COVID excess deaths. So you've got these other people that are not going to hospitals who are dying of other, of other causes. You can't get a, a, an accurate take on that coverage or you can't even get it to be covered. And then you have the, have the COVID disease itself. They, they, <laughs> the news media has made quite a quite a production out of um, the Trump administration supposedly uh, calling into question the way that, that the deaths are counted. 
if you die, as we know, the CDC laid this out uh, months ago, several weeks ago, if you die with COVID-19, that goes on the death certificate. If you had cancer and you were about to die, if you, if you are suffering from diabetes, if you've got all these comorbidities, and you're just about to die, and then you get a little bit of a sniffle there at the end, it's COVID. The cause is coronavirus. And, and many, many experts, I think we can call them that, many doctors have come forward and said, yes, that's what we're doing. We're being told to do this. So the media go on and on saying, how can President Trump question the way that these figures are being calculated? And yet look at what, look at what some of the people in the hospitals themselves are, are saying. This montage that Sam put together, you'll hear the bookends from uh, Anderson Cooper and then Dr. Fauci at the end, but listen closely to all the individuals in between. This is clip eight. There have been rumblings now for quite some time yeah. that the president, and even publicly, the president sort of seemed to be questioning the death toll itself, that it was somehow phony in some way. In this country, we've taken a very liberal approach to mortality. There are other countries that if you had a pre-existing condition, and let's say the virus called you to go to the ICU and then have a heart or kidney problem, some countries are recording that as a heart issue or a kidney issue and not a COVID-19 death. Um, right now, we're still recording it. The intent is right now that those, if someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that as a COVID-19 death. Well, last Friday, I received a seven-page document that sort of told me that if I had an 86-year-old patient that had pneumonia but was never tested for COVID-19. But sometime after she came down with pneumonia, we learned that she had been exposed to her son who had no symptoms, but later on was identified with COVID-19, that it would be appropriate to diagnose on the death certificate COVID-19. We aren't pressured to test for flu, but ER doctors now, my friends that I talk to say, you know, it's interesting, when I'm, when I'm writing up my death report, I'm being pressured to add COVID. Why is that? Why are we being pressured to add COVID? If you were in hospice and had already been given, you know, a few weeks to live, and then you also were found to have COVID, that would be counted as a COVID death. Even if you died of a clear alternate cause, but you had COVID at the same time, it's still listed as a COVID death. You weighed in on a theory that's been floating around that perhaps the number of fatalities related to COVID-19 is being inflated because people are actually dying of other things. Uh, can, what's your read on that theory? You know, Savannah, there is absolutely no evidence that that's the case at all. Absolutely no evidence? You have all these people say, the, the lady before, I think she's a representative somewhere in the upper Midwest, Michigan maybe. Even if there's a clear alternate cause of death, if COVID, if you have any symptoms, even if it looks like you have symptoms, even if you haven't been tested, the CDC said, look, if you don't have time to test them, but they had what seemed like symptoms of COVID-19, even if there was clearly an alternate cause, an underlying cause, well, just mark it down as covid that's what we've been doing. And so these deaths, particularly in the United States, and I think it's the same in the UK, but especially so in the US, the, the 87,000 deaths, these are not excess deaths. We'll know better in another few weeks, probably. Another month or two, we'll have, we'll have a better reading on how many excess deaths. There have been excess deaths. There's no doubt about it. This has its worked its way right through elderly homes all across America. In some states, far worse than others because of these horrific policies put in place, like in New York, sending sick patients into the elderly homes. That's what Governor Cuomo did. In any event, 
How many excess deaths will we, will we see at the end of all this? And, and did it justify a complete and total shutdown, a lockdown? Indefinitely. London has 24 new cases. Still locked down. This was from the Daily Mail a week or so ago. It says a whistleblower has claimed elderly COVID-19 patients are being sent to care homes to die as part of a long-standing culture of freeing up hospital beds. So just like in New York, we can't take them into the hospital. We've got to keep those beds free because there's a flood that's coming, an onslaught. So send them back to the uh, elderly care centers. It says the source, whose work means they have uh, close connections with care homes in the UK, allege that people are currently being discharged from hospital before their coronavirus test results are known. As a result, patients risk missing out on crucial treatment, contributing to the care home sector's soaring death toll which currently stands at 3,096 on the week ending April 17th. So those are figures that are uh, pretty old by this point. Here we are now in the middle of May, but these statistics coming out of just dreadful, coming out of these elderly uh, centers, and of course you look at uh, some of the studies. This is from Real... Real clear of politics. It says the influenza pandemic of 1918 tended to kill otherwise healthy people in the prime of life, ages 20 to 40. COVID 19 tends to kill people age 70 and above, especially those with comorbidities. So the elderly who are sick, these are the most vulnerable. Yet despite that being apparent early on, America's governors have done a poor job of protecting those most at risk. It says residents of nursing homes with physical frailties and often cognitive impairment. The result, one-third of reported coronavirus deaths in the U.S., according to the New York Times, are of nursing home residents or workers. One-third. And, of course, there's some states where it's even much higher. Minnesota, I think it was something like 70 or 80 percent. It says other states recognizing, well, let me just back up because you know a little bit about this story regarding New York and Governor Cuomo, and it refers to this directive that he gave. Remember March 25th, he said if a COVID patient comes to the nursing home, you've got to accept them in. You've got to take them in, and then you've got to deal with them. You've got to quarantine them. You've got to have staff for them. You've got to have equipment for them. We can't have them in the hospitals. Because we've got to have empty beds. The empty beds are more important. That's what it amounts to. It says, when asked about this policy in late April, Governor Andrew Cuomo professed ignorance. Two weeks later, on May 9th, after 46 days in effect, he reversed it. So it took 46 days for him to finally change course. He's a, he's a possible presidential candidate because he's handled it so well, the crisis. This is what we're told in the fake news media. It says other states, recognizing the dangers of infecting the vulnerable, required or encouraged nursing homes to set up separate units or staffs to handle patients testing positive. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, he's evil, the major media says, Ron DeSantis, widely criticized in the national media for avoiding a total lockdown, zeroed in on nursing homes, encouraging repeated testing and temperature taking of residents and staff and isolating anyone testing positive. Florida, listen to this, Florida, a state with 2 million more people than New York, had just 714 nursing home deaths, 13% of the number in New York. 13%. He's taken a different approach. And he's come under attack because of it, just like the governor in Georgia and even the governor right here in Oklahoma. The the, The facts are in. The lockdown is being lifted. 
The disease is not spreading. There are no, there's not an outbreak of new cases. Oklahoma, I think we just came past two days this week where there was zero deaths. These are some of the states where the restrictions are being lifted. And yet here again, how many stories did we read up front when Georgia first did that a couple weeks ago? Oh, this is really going to be dangerous. Georgia's making a big mistake. The facts get buried. The truth, the truth is cast to the ground. Well, if you have some time this weekend, look at Proverbs uh, 8. It's a wonderful chapter uh, that I don't have time to get into just yet. But the first 13, 14, 15 verses of that chapter have uh, some really encouraging words about the truth. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to submit feedback, you can email us, td at kpcg.fm. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next week.